Yeah, I really want to thank everyone for joining me tonight. Uh, first of all, I really want to say that I'm not a climate expert. I'm a weaving teacher and with these slides I'm going to weave together my food and climate story. Uh, what I'm going to share with you uh, is how my consciousness and my actions have changed over the years, what I've learned and what I'm doing now. My goal with uh, putting these slides together is really to support you if you're already on this path, or if you aren't, I hope I can encourage you to start. So like most people, my food story starts with eating the standard American diet. When I was a kid, I really loved being with my Aunt Margaret and Uncle Freddie on their little dairy farm in Wisconsin. Uh, my main food memory of that time is the humongous bowl of cornflakes that my Uncle Freddie ate for breakfast. <laughs> And uh, part of the adventure for, of being on the farm was that they didn't have any indoor plumbing. Um, so my first job after college was at a TV station in Greensboro, North Carolina. I had majored in home economics in college and during my senior year I found that I really loved doing food demonstrations on video. And so after that I took some video production classes. So that led to doing the weather and feature reporting uh, for the 11 o'clock news. And uh, my uh, big um, accomplishment, I guess, was introducing the viewers to radar weather for the first time. Uh, my food memories uh, from Greensboro are mostly along the lines of barbecue, hush puppies, and pecan pie. <laughs> Uh, I moved to Portland in 1977 to take a job in video production at what's now OPB. And fast forward to the day that changed my life, November 1st, 1984, uh, the day that I took my first weaving lesson at Ruthie's Weaving Studio. I've thought of myself as a weaver ever since, and I've been teaching weaving since 1992. Mm. So I've been on the trail of the healthiest foods since the early 70s when I was diagnosed as pre-diabetic. And I am not currently uh, pre-diabetic, so I, think, I, I believe that food <laughs> really cured, I was able to cure myself. Um, I've read a ton of nutrition books and cookbooks and my ideas about what is healthy have really evolved a lot over time. I didn't really know anybody who was a vegetarian until I met the great British weaver and teacher Peter Collingwood in 1993. A few years later I asked him, why are you a vegetarian? And he just said, health, kindness to animals, best use of the earth's resources, and he never said another thing about it, but that really stuck in my mind. Um, in 2000 I started attending the Joyful Refuge Sangha and reading books by our teacher Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Zen master, poet, and peace activist. And I learned about the practice of mindfulness, including mindful eating, and contemplating with full awareness the food on my plate and its true cost. And that is a band that I wove uh, on the altar there. Um, partly as a result of the influence of these two important teachers, I made a commitment to be a vegetarian in May 2001, and that was right after my dad's funeral. Mm. So over the next few years, eggs and dairy started to disappear from my diet. In 2010, I joined Northwest Veg, started taking classes and attending a lot of their events. Uh, I've been whole food plant-based since about 2012, and in 2018, I got a certificate in plant-based no oil cooking from the Ruby Online Cooking School. In the last few years, I've started reading a lot of books about climate, and I've become more aware of the connection between the climate crisis and what we eat. So in, in uh, 2019, I, I was really feeling more and more upset about climate change. I, I did go to a few meetings of Extinction Rebellion and uh, thought a lot about whether I was willing to be arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience. I, I actually haven't done anything that dramatic, but but I did a few actions uh, with Extinction, the Extinction Rebellion Red Rebel Brigade, and this is at the Portland Climate March in 2019. That's me in the front there, in case you can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, in um, 
2020, I took Al Gore's Climate Reality Leadership Training, and this was the first time that they'd ever offered the training online with participants from around the world. I joined the local Climate Reality Chapter, and I helped start the Climate Friendly Food Committee. So now let's uh, think about our beautiful Earth and what's happening to it. This is the famous photo taken on December 7, 1972, when the crew of Apollo 17 was heading to the moon. And this is the view from 28,000 miles up in space and the first time that we ever saw the entire Earth in one photograph. When you're standing on the ground and looking up at a clear blue sky, you might just think that it goes on and on, but in reality, there's just a very thin shell of atmosphere surrounding our planet. This is a photo taken from the International Space Station, 254 miles up. And that blue line is, is the two lowest layers uh, of the atmosphere. All the weather happens in that first layer, the, tr um, the troposphere. And that only goes up about five to nine miles. I mean, I can actually bike that far. <laughs> and the second layer, uh, the stratosphere, uh, goes up 31 miles above the ground. And that's where the ozone layer is and uh, where commercial airplanes fly because it's a smoother ride up there above the weather. So here's what we're doing to this thin shell of atmosphere. It's hard to get your mind around those numbers. Uh, and of course, usually we don't see anything as dramatic as this photo. But the important thing is that this pollution is building up every single day and thickening the atmosphere and trapping heat. So um, where does all that pollution come from? Uh, as you can see here, there are a lot of sources. The main cause, that, and the one we hear about the most, is the burning of fossil fuels. But there's another source that doesn't get anywhere near as much attention in the news. A uh, report from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization uh, revealed that meat production creates more greenhouse gases than all of transportation. This, is, this would be globally. More than all cars, trains, planes, and ships in the world combined. If cattle were their own nation, they would be the world's third, third largest emitter of greenhouse gases. Livestock production is the largest global source of methane, which is far more effective at trapping heat than carbon dioxide. Another reason that uh, animal agriculture contributes so much to climate change is just the huge number of animals uh, that are raised for food every year. And this is some data from the UN Food uh, and Agriculture Organization. It's comparing the number of humans on the planet, which is in 2014, which is in blue, with the number of animals bred for food in that year, in green. In that year, we had about 7.3 billion people on the planet, and uh, 67.9 billion animals were being raised for food. That's almost 70 billion, with a B. That means that li the livestock population is about 10 times the human population on Earth. And in the U.S. alone, there are over 9 billion land animals raised for food every year, more than the entire human population on the planet. The huge number of animals uh, produce a tremendous amount of waste. Farm animals in the U.S. produce 44 times more waste than the entire U.S. human population. Most of it sits in giant manure lagoons that release nitrous oxide a greenhouse gas that's even more effective at trapping heat than carbon dioxide. And all of that manure and all the fertilizer used to grow the corn and soy that's fed to the animals on the factory farms is also a leading cause of water pollution. It runs off into local streams and rivers and eventually they make their way to the Mississippi and into the Gulf of Mexico where it just creates a gigantic dead zone. The reason uh, that there are so many animals raised for food every year is because demand has really skyrocketed. Uh, globally, we eat more meat per person uh, per year than dietary recommendations. Those would be mostly government recommendations. In the U.S., we eat nearly twice as much meat as our government recommends. Most continents around the world are also eating far more meat than recommended. So I've been learning uh, quite a bit about climate solutions from the book Drawdown and, and the website Drawdown. 
and uh, the book presents 80 solutions, highly readable, enlightening, and really often quite entertaining. I, I really recommend this book. And in Drawdown, there are let's see, um, 17 uh, solutions in the food sector that are discussed. And on this slide, I've just highlighted three that are uh, can, that can really be tackled at the individual level. So we'll, we'll look at each one of them briefly. So the first, uh, the first one is a plant-rich diet. And when it comes to what we eat, uh, the more plants, the better. Um, by eating more plants, we could have dramatically lower greenhouse gas emissions. We could have better health, especially in terms of prevention of chronic diseases. And we could have economic benefits that are directly tied to improved health with uh, savings in health care costs and lost productivity. It took me about 40 years to make a complete change in my diet. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that kind of time left now. My husband John and I uh, tend to favor pretty simple food. Uh, we typically have steel-cut oats for breakfast, veggie bowls for lunch, and soup and salad for dinner. Uh, and the pictures on this slide show some of the favorite, our favorite things to eat. Uh, the recipes for all of these dishes, uh, along with a few other ones, are on my website. Um, you can also Google climate-friendly recipes to find a lot more. So this is a really helpful comparison of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions from some common foods. Uh, this chart shows um, greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of consumed food. And I really like this chart because it divides each bar into two sections. The green section is production emissions like raising animals and growing crops. And the gold section is what's called the post farm gate emissions. So that would be processing transport, retail, cooking, and waste disposal. So you can see that lamb and beef and cheese have the highest emissions and lentils are the lowest. Now here is another way to look at the data uh, by relative carbon emissions per calorie. Again, beef at the bottom has the highest emissions, legumes, that would be beans and lentils at the top have the lowest. And yeah, I think this is interesting just because it is included, this chart is included in the 2015 Multnomah County and City of Portland Climate Action Plan. In terms of reduced food waste, about a third of the food grown and, uh, or raised ends up wasted. That was shocking when I first learned that. Uh, and at the same time, there are some 800 million people uh, worldwide who don't have enough to eat. So basically, we have people who need fo food that are not getting it, and food that's not consumed is heating up the planet. In the low-income countries, uh, loss is typically because uh, it's unintended, because of bad roads or lack of refrigeration or storage or a combination of heat and humidity. And solutions in those parts of the world would include uh, improving infra infrastructure for storage, processing, and transportation. And in the higher income parts of the world, there's more willful food waste, like rejecting produce that isn't the ideal size or shape, or ordering too much in restaurants. So the solutions uh, can come at many levels, grocery stores, businesses, restaurants, and, and particularly the in the individual consumer where there's quite a lot of waste. So John and I um, buy most of our food in bulk from People's Food Co-op. He is the main shopper. I'll give him the credit for that. And uh, we store the food mostly in glass jars so that it's easy to see what we have. And we try to keep the more perishable things at the front of the refrigerator. And we also don't really like to keep our refrigerator too full. Uh, and that makes it easier to, to find what's in there. One thing that John and I do uh, to be sure we don't waste food is that we always take our own containers for leftovers every time we go to a restaurant. And that includes when we travel. Uh, no matter whether it's by car or even by air, we always take a, a bag, a small uh, ba a refrigerator type bag um, with our um, containers and always take our food <laughs> with us. 
Uh, and we always make sure that we eat the leftovers in the next day or two. So the last solution we'll look at from drawdown is composting. Uh, nearly half of the solid waste produced is organic or biodegradable. And a lot of this is either food waste or leaves from yards and parks. Today, unfortunately, much of that ends up in landfills. Uh, and if, it, if there's no oxygen, it, uh, it produces methane. Some landfills do have uh, some form of methane management, but it's much more effective uh, to just use composting. In Portland, of course, we are uh, lucky to be able to put our food scraps into our green bin uh, with the yard debris for a weekly pickup. Uh, John and I have a, one drawer in our refrigerator that's reserved for food scraps to be composted. We just rough chop everything as we go. Um, any woody parts, uh, seeds, citrus peels, and that sort of thing goes into that white container in the lower right, and then uh, that eventually goes into the green bin, and everything else, including the coffee filters, uh, goes into our black metro bin in the backyard, which is that. Uh, when the, um, yeah, so when the containers are full, uh, we just mix everything up and then take it out to the metro bin um, and cover it with uh, shredded leaves. There's a, there is a little door there you can see in the bottom that slides up so we can get out our finished compost. And here's a look inside the bin. Uh, I do uh, have an electric shredder so I, I keep shredded leaves on hand all the time. And uh, so after I put in the food, I just put uh, some shredded leaves on top. It's very neat and uh, just smells like leaves. Um, when I started the bin, uh, I actually put in some red wigglers, and they're, they're still living there. Uh, you can dig down an inch or so, and you can see them working away. I don't turn the material in the bin, so this is a cold compost uh, system. I don't really want to disturb my worms, so it's a kind of a slow process. And uh, one last thing about composting. Uh, you've probably heard of natural burial, but maybe not the idea of having yourself composted. <laughs> um, so this is uh, kind of a new thing, and I ha love the idea, and I've actually already signed up for this. And uh, I'm looking forward to having my uh, composted remains uh, spread about a forest. Um, so for every person who chooses natural organic reduction over conventional um, cremation, there's one metric ton of carbon dioxide prevented from entering the atmosphere. And in addition, human composting at this company, Recompose, uh, requires about one-eighth of the energy of conventional uh, cremation. So we, need, we definitely need to do everything that we can uh, about the climate crisis. And on this uh, little brochure, I just wanted to take a look at uh, the impacts of the various choices that I'm sure that you've all heard about and, and possibly already do. This is uh, some research from Sweden where the researchers examined uh, the steps that individuals can take. Uh, one thing that they, uh, that they say is that changes in individual behavior can be faster than waiting for national climate policy. So I think that's important to not think, oh, I'm just one person, I can't possibly make a difference. I think it is important that everybody do as much as possible. So as you can see on this chart, if you look at the, at the um, left-hand side, the low impact uh, area, um, actually the only thing they have in that section is upgrading your light bulbs. And then the moderate impact section includes hanging your clothes to dry instead of using the dryer, uh, recycling, washing clothes in cold water, and replacing a typical car with a hybrid. And so far my husband and I have done all of those. Um, so then in the high impact area the first one is eating a plant-based diet uh, and then switching from an electric car to car free, buying green energy, avoiding transatlantic flights, and having one less child which of course has the highest impact. And again, we, just, we definitely need to do everything we can. So I'm just gonna talk a little more about the eating the plant-based diet. So um, I've done a lot of um, reading about healthy eating, but I've really just in the last couple of years started researching the phrase climate-friendly food. And what's really exciting to me, I would say, is uh, 
that climate-friendly food is also the most healthy. So we can, um, you know, diseases, chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes and heart disease, we can think of as being prevented or reversed by eating climate-friendly food. And of course, the minute you start talking about uh, eating less meat, people will say, where do you get your protein? But I wonder if any, anybody has ever heard of a protein deficiency problem in the United States. Um, you, you do not hear about that. Uh, all plants have proteins. Uh, you don't need to put together any special combinations. And basically, if you eat a wide variety of foods, as long as you're getting enough calories, you definitely get enough protein. But I would say, and this is me getting on my high fiber diet uh, little <laughs> platform here, uh, I think a more relevant question is where do you get your fiber? because there's no dietary fiber at all in meat or animal products, and there actually is a fiber deficiency problem in this country. Fewer than 3% of Americans get the recommended amount of fiber. And I put listed two websites that I think are quite good if you want more information about that, nutritionfacts.org and theplantfedgut.com. So when you're shopping for climate-friendly food, just try to stay in the produce and bulk sections. Bring your own paper or recycled plastic bags for bulk. Um, stay away from pa packaging if you can. You know, try to avoid plastic. We actually do buy some frozen food, and you know, frozen food is still pretty much coming in plastic. And we save our bags from frozen food to use for getting bulk food. <laughs> Uh, this is actually a little bit of information um, about the connection between diet and surviving COVID-19 that I thought was interesting. Uh, the Center for Disease Control reported that people with underlying conditions like obesity, heart disease, and kidney disease, and diabetes are at a much higher risk of life-threatening complications from the virus. And hospitalizations were six times higher, and deaths were 12 times higher. So again, Plant-based, climate-friendly diet can prevent and reverse many of those chronic underlying conditions. I uh, want to emphasize, and really tell myself this too, how important it is to talk to people about climate-friendly food and the relationship between food and climate. Um, here and on the next slide, I, I want to just present a few significant results from a, a recent survey uh, one encouraging finding is that many people in the survey said they would eat more plant-based foods if they had more information about the impact of their food choices, but it just isn't something that people talk about, so we really need to work on changing that. So 70% said they rarely or never talk about the issue, two-thirds reported never even having been asked to eat more plant-based foods. Uh, one, possibly one way to get some conversation go going would be to read and share one of these books, and these, these have all been published since 2018. Uh, I think a good one to start with is Eat for the Planet, the one up in the upper left there, Eat for the Planet, Saving the World One Bite at a Time. And this is a, a small, easy to read book, gives uh, you know really easy to understand explanation of all the issues that are involved, and it's really full of bold and simple graphics that, that make the point very well. The other ones are all cookbooks uh, that have text on the importance uh, of eating climate-friendly food. And of course you all know that, uh, sin or, or you've heard, heard maybe, that uh, since 2015 my husband and I have, have hosted the Meetup uh, Plant-Based Portland, and this is from our August 2019 uh, potluck. Um, we used to have a monthly potluck and uh, would always gather around. First, we'd gather around the table uh, where we put out the food and everybody would talk about what they brought. And then after serving ourselves, we, we would go around the table and answer the really uh, open question, what's on your mind about food? And I, I just love those conversations and I've always learned a lot. And, um, you know, we, we're keeping it going on Zoom, uh, you know, still having our conversation and some people holding up their plate or their bowl uh, to the camera. We're getting toward the end and now I just want to share uh, three pieces of my fiber art that are relevant to our discussion. Uh, this is a band that contains a pangram that I wove to illustrate um, an alphabet for my book, Please Weave a Message. 
Uh, so a pangram is a sentence that contains every letter of the alphabet and mm -hmm. uh, is used to show a script or a font. So uh, it was really fun making up uh, things to weave, you know, pangrams for, for my book. And um, this one, I think, is relevant to what we're talking about right now. Maybe you could, you could be thinking about that while you're changing your diet. <laughs> Uh, this is a ply split braid, um, and it was on display at the third International Braiding and Narrow Weaves conference that was held in uh, at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma in 2016. And this one is one of my most recent piece. Uh, when I started working about it, I was really thinking about the fires in uh, California and Oregon. The images on the top, uh, part of that is uh, is a design that's used in the Extinction Rebellion logo and then the little dots are kind of the reminder of sand going through an hourglass and this piece was actually on display at the Latimer Quilt and Textile Center in Tillamook uh, in September 2020 when there were fires right in that area. Finally I want to share uh, some questions that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, when I think about questions like this um, it helps me clarify my thoughts and points me in a positive direction. Uh, there's a phrase that uh, has been really helpful to me, action creates motivation. So I want to really encourage you to embrace all of the food uh, solutions to the climate crisis, especially making a commitment to eat more plants for your own health, for the health and future of our one and only beautiful planet. There are lots of resources available locally and online. I, I'm going to put a, just a few on the screen. Uh, uh, you can, again, check out uh, my favorite recipes on my website. Uh, and all of my contact information is there. So if you ever have any questions, uh, I would love it if you'd get in, uh, get in touch with me. And uh, of course, if you are not a member of Plant-Based Portland Meetup, I encourage you to join. Um, I hope we get back to having our potlucks, uh, maybe sometime uh, the first part of the year or, or shortly after that. And then Northwest Veg is a great local organization with a lot of activities uh, in the Portland, Vancouver area. And then here are three of my favorite websites, Drawdown, um, which has many solutions to the climate crisis with a big section on food. The Factory Farming Awareness Coalition is uh, just an excellent source of information on that topic and uh, nutritionfacts.org again has just a ton of facts on plant-based nutrition <laughs> and uh, many short videos uh, that are usually only about five minutes long so you can definitely um, you know take the time to watch uh, videos on topics that are of interest to you. Um, the other thing is to just Google different strings that, and, um, you know, like these are just some examples of things that you could Google, uh, climate-friendly food or climate-friendly recipes. Um, you'll find all sorts of things now, books, videos, yeah, all, all kinds of yeah, good information. Greenhouse gas emissions from food, if you Google that and then go uh, click on images, you'll see lots of those charts uh, presenting the data in different ways. Um, and uh, you can search for uh, comparisons of certain uh, foods, you know, like if you wanted to compare the greenhouse gas emissions from beef and beans, there's all, all kinds of uh, stuff like that. Or like, like you might want to compare cow's milk to plant-based, different plant-based milks. That's all uh, readily available online. So uh, finally, I, I want to just tell you about the Climate Friendly Food Challenge. And this is a five session challenge that I put together uh, and have presented one time so far with a co-host from the Pachamama Alliance. Uh, we had a group of 12 people uh, last spring. And uh, each week uh, we have themes and activities. Uh, participants receive a list of readings and videos for discussion. And uh, the goal of the challenge is really to motivate uh, participants to take action on food choices as solutions to climate change, the things that, we've, that I've been talking about in this presentation. Uh, 
So moving toward a plant-based diet or plant, or plant rich diet, minimizing food waste and composting. And uh, we are ready and available uh, to offer it again. We would love to have another group going and if you have a, if you are interested or if you have a group like a faith-based community or a social group or something like that, uh, you can contact me and we'll, we'll get it set up.